Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are just starting today's webinar on analyzing real world data with AI, real world biomedical data, brought to us by Professor Fei Wang of Health Informatics at the Weill Cornell School of Medicine. Uh, we're going to let people join the webinar uh, as we speak, and we'll be starting in just seconds. So thank you all for joining us. All right, why don't we go to the next slide? And I can begin our, our a conversation and introduce our esteemed guest today. Um, as a couple of reminders to the audience, um, feel free to use social media. Uh, if you're so inclined, um, at Matt Health Data is the health is the handle for the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium. The hashtag for today is MHDC event. Uh, we have handles for Fei Wang at Fei Wang 03 and at Wild Cornell. Uh, you will be muted during today's presentation, and we ask that you submit your questions by typing them into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen um, and feel free to tweet uh, using the, um, the, the the information that I've provided. Um, we'll be having a very brief one or three one to three question survey at the end of today's presentation. Uh, please take a moment to uh, complete that for us. It helps us uh, provide you uh, the best possible content and information we can. And uh, we'll be taking you briefly uh, to see what MHDC events are coming up in the, the coming weeks. Um, next page, please. On December 7th, MHDC will be hosting a demonstration of our Spotlight Analytics Service, a web-hosted platform for producing health analytics that combine not only the business Did we lose Denny? I, I think so. Well, hi folks, this is Katie Klausner. I'm, I head up uh, marketing and membership for MHDC. Until we get Denny back, I'll just uh, continue. Oh, there he is. Excuse hi, me. I'm, we lost you. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me make sure I'm I'm getting the best communication here. I'll turn off one of my network settings. Yep. You were just telling us about Spotlight when we lost your video and audio. So we thought we we thought you had left us for another webinar. <laughs> oh, not a chance. Not a chance. Thank you. Um, Spotlight, as I mentioned, is a is a tool, a, a hosted service that allows you to analyze both business statistics as well as measures of health equity. We encourage you to join us on December 7th at 2 p.m for a demonstration and we will record that demonstration so that those of you who are unable to be with us at that time can join us. Um, let's go to the next slide. On December 14th, my good friend and colleague, uh, Roberta Schwartz from Houston Methodist Hospital will be joining us. Many of you may know Roberta. She is one of the finest healthcare executives in the country, one of the best hospital executives you could meet. Um, she is known for among other for among other factors as helping Houston Methodist and its partner hospitals and other hospitals in the greater Houston community coordinate a virtual ICU during the height of the COVID pandemic back in 2020 before vaccines at the height of the first surge where, Method, where Houston and Methodist were ground zero for a tremendous upsurge in COVID cases. Roberta spearheaded with physicians, intensivists, and a number of other technology and organizational colleagues, a virtual ICU that allowed Methodist and a large number of companion hospitals to coordinate ICU care as if they were one virtual ICU. This is just an example of the kinds of things that Roberta has done in the way of innovation. So I encourage those of you who want to learn more about how do we as health systems today 
deal with the fact that there are so many constraints to 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 delivering patient care. There are labor constraints. There are COVID constraints. There are constraints in uh, the management of post-acute care, which creates bottlenecks in the system. What kind of innovations can be brought to bear? So we encourage you to join us on December 14th for that. So you will see in the chat box uh, information about registration. We ask that you uh, take a moment to register for those. Uh, they're great events. Uh, so let's go to the next page. First, I want to introduce Fei Wang, professor at the Cornell, Wild Cornell School of Medicine, and one of the nation's leaders in artificial intelligence and biomedical data. Uh, Faye, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, uh, Danny. Uh, first, I want to make sure everybody can see my screen and hear me okay. We do. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, it's my uh, great pleasure to share some of my experience. And first, uh, thanks uh, uh, MHDC's uh, invitation. And um, it's my uh, great pleasure to share some of my experience. Uh, I have been working on uh, machine learning AI for uh, 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 real world biomedical data for like 12 years. Uh, so uh, I want to share with uh, everybody my journey and also some of the uh, example projects we have been uh, working on. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, so uh, feel free to type and Danny, feel free to interrupt me. <clears throat> and for, for myself, a little bit uh, uh, introduction. So I got my PhD in pure machine learning. So nothing related to life science or uh, healthcare. Uh, and then um, I, I got my PhD in um, uh, 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 Tsinghua, which is uh, one of the best at engineering or science university in China. And then I went to U.S. and I did two postdocs, one in data mining in Miami, the other in statistics in Cornell. And then I joined uh, IBM as a researcher. Actually, that was in 2010. And I was uh, one of the uh, founding member of uh, the healthcare analytics research group uh, in T.J. Watson Research Center. And actually, the uh, a famous uh, Watson, you know, question answering machine. I mean, that one's the Jeopardy challenge that was in 2010. And after that, so uh, they kind of like want to use uh, or leverage this kind of technologies in various applications. And uh, you, you saw later on, like healthcare is one of their uh, main focus, but uh, there are a lot of stories there. And then in 2015, I actually, <clears throat> joined the uh, uh, Department of Computer Science and Engineering in Connecticut. Um, and in 2016, I moved to uh, Cornell uh, in my current department and uh, uh, stay there until now. Uh, so I have been mainly involved in two communities. So one is the AMIA uh, community, American Medical Informatics Association, and it's an uh, international version. So IMEA, International Medical Informatics Association, like that fellows in uh, both of the communities. And there's also American College of Medical Informatics. Uh, and the other community is um, ACM stands for uh, Association for Computing Machinery. So that's a major community for computer scientists, including like data mining, machine learning, AI, uh, whatever. So that's uh, kind of like a, a, a journey of myself. Uh, I have been trained as a uh, technical person and get in, get really into this uh, healthcare or biomedicine field since 2010. So it has been um, uh, 12 years uh, until now. So, uh, uh, you know, a lot of us here, like machine learning, AI uh, in various different kinds of places and see a lot of, uh, you know, success and stories. Uh, of machine learning and that uh, actually deep learning is one particular type of machine learning technologies and uh, some examples I show here like from uh, you know I, sh I should put IBM's um, you know Watson machine uh, in the first and then later on Google's you know uh, AlphaGo playing the Go game uh, and also the autonomous driving system you see now in a lots of um, uh, uh, different types of cars, um, and also 
you know, like these uh, um, voice recognition, like, um, you know, a Siri on your iPhone and also this Alexa. And uh, this the last one, there's something called the GPT-3, but uh, it is an older one, you know, last week, uh, OpenAI, which is a company developed this large, um, you know, um, uh, deep learning model trying to uh, realize general intelligence so you can communicate, you can speak with uh, this uh, uh, model, uh, GPT-3, uh, and it, 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 it can't answer any type of questions. Uh, and uh, I think last week they just released a new version called a chat GPT. And, uh, you know, if you play with uh, Twitter and other, you know, like uh, social media, like Reddit, lots of people are uh, playing with that and, uh, you know, uh, they they got amazed by how real this machine can do conversation like a real human. So these are kind of like uh, a lot of the uh, uh, promises and um, uh, you know uh, successes you saw uh, in those different areas. So people have been thinking about in medicine. We still a lot have a lot of things that um, uh, hopefully uh, can um, improve. Uh, so over the years, we have also uh, uh, certainly thanks to all those um, uh, development of the hardware and software systems like uh, the EHR system. So a large amount of heterogeneous uh, healthcare data are accumulated, uh, you know, with respect to those individual patients uh, over the years. Like um, I just to show some examples here, like. Uh, uh, you know, electronic health records, uh, of course, within that this, this structured information like the ICD code, the CPT code, whatever, but also the unstructured parts, that's the clinical notes, uh, and also physiological signals and videos and dialogues, um, biomedical literatures, um, images and pharmaceutical research and development, and then so on and so forth. So we have accumulated those different kinds of data and all of them could be related to um, particular healthcare conditions. Um, so uh, people are thinking of, uh, uh, so clearly these are massive data and a lot of challenges of uh, different types. Um, so these AI and machine learning algorithms, you guys have demonstrated in other uh, domains that um, uh, you're capable or um, excelled at um, you know, processing those data and extract the useful information from those massive data. So can they also be applied here? Um, so one of the important um, uh, like demand or perspective on why these things are important is this uh, uh, initiative of uh, precision medicine. So um, uh, when it was um, uh, you know, pushed out, so Francis Collins, the past director of NIH, talked about like, uh, why do we need precision medicine? This is because those disease conditions are so heterogeneous. I will show you examples later on, like people have COVID, you have all kinds of uh, uh, different uh, uh, clinical symptoms. So it um, a lot of the times it might be even, you can think of multiple diseases rather than the same disease, but they're so heterogeneous. So it is uh, very challenging for the convention of one size fits all type of uh, strategy for developing drugs to work and for these complicated disease. So precision medicine is really, can we, uh, you know, figure out um, uh, the most appropriate uh, treatment or management plans for uh, individual patients based on their, um, you know, specific uh, uh, characteristics. So uh, there is a particular a sentence I copied out from this perspective. So the initiative will encourage and support Next generation of scientists to, create, to develop creative new approaches for detecting, measuring, and analyzing wide range of biomedical information, including molecular, genomic, cellular, clinical, behavioral, physiological, and even environmental factors. So this is really massive data, heterogeneous data, longitudinal data, and um, you know it's uh, the challenge of analyzing them as uh, you know. Um, uh, 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 I mean, we never uh, met this kind of challenge before. So a lot of the conventional tools, uh, biostatistics tools may not be readily avail uh, I mean, applicable here uh, because these data, they just violate whatever the statistical hypothesis or assumptions we used to have in those conventional 
uh, methods. So certainly uh, these uh, new methods like machine learning type approaches could have some uh, potential here. So um, that's kind of like the motivation. So, so why do we want to apply those things and why those things could be attractive to medicine and healthcare? So I will uh, in the in the following slides, show you some of the examples of um, the projects I personally have either been involved or leading uh, in the past twelve years. So I mean, these are some of the papers I wrote over the years. I mean, uh, more like uh, uh, related to like either reviews or perspectives on how AI or deep learning or machine learning can be applied in medicine, like from the very early this, uh, uh, you know, uh, deep learning healthcare review. And later on, I have this perspective in JAMA internal medicine and also this uh, perspective. Um, a lot of people talking about, you know, these uh, deep learning models, complicated models, uh, uh, monsters, uh, black boxes, in, and uh, it is, uh, 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 you know, hard hard to be trusted in these things. So are, are those uh, interpretability important? Um, and, and later on, and more review, uh, like a review, like the state of the art of AI in health, and also in particular disease area, like mental health, like this, uh, um, you know, musculoskeletal condition and COVID. Uh, uh, so this, but all these are kind of like not concrete research, but really, uh, you know, envision uh, the the promise or review uh, what has already been achieved and. Um, you know what what's the challenge and what could be the future directions um so if um, uh, you are interested in it or uh, you know you are in any of these disease area uh you know uh feel free uh, to read and also um uh, ask questions afterwards um well but uh, i i work on various kinds of biomedical data uh, i will show you in the last slide but uh, uh in this talk i mean i want to particularly uh, focus on uh, 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 several projects I have been doing related to electronic health records because that's the data I uh, uh, work uh, I, I work on since I started um, uh, you know uh, my research on machine learning for uh, biomedicine. So I think for this audience I don't need to explain. So uh, what are electronic health records? So um, they are longitudinal so for every patient. So if you pay a visit to the clinic, you got uh, a whole bunch of uh, information recorded in the EHR system, including like uh, diagnosis medication, uh, you know, lab tests, uh, procedures, and so on and so forth. And if you pay multiple visits to the clinic over the time, you're going to have a longitudinal sequence if you concatenate them visit by visit. And of course, the information is highly heterogeneous. You also have like a clinical notes. Um, and uh, it could be very sparse because for most of the patients, unless you need regular visit for certain health conditions for checkups, uh, but uh, for uh, uh, other people like me, I mean, you wouldn't pay like uh, intense visit or very frequent visit uh, to the hospital. So it is very, uh, it is uh, pretty sparse. And of course, lots of information are encoded. So uh, let's, let's uh, see some examples on how we can, uh, you know, leverage electronic health records to, you know, um, uh, uh, do some uh, task uh, related to uh, healthcare. Uh, so, so the first thing, and also one of the most prevalent thing you see people using EHR as uh, to develop, uh, you know, to develop models for uh, risk prediction. Like in this case, this is what I think the earliest project I have been working on when I after I joined IBM. So uh, uh, I mean, this is a collaboration with Geisinger. So uh, I mean, the, the 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 problem they're interested in is so they have this uh, a pretty high quality uh, data from Geisinger Health System, uh, and uh, uh, they want to study the risk of a congestive heart failure. We know. Like for congestive heart failure, so the, 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 I mean uh, the uh, pop, uh, the most popular. I I I I don't know if it is the most popular or not, but the popular criteria for diagnosing 
uh, a congestive heart failure is a, a, a set of symptoms called Framingham symptoms. So they have a set of uh, major symptoms, a, a set of minor symptoms. So if you satisfy some major and minor symptoms, then they can diagnose you have, you probably have a congestive heart failure. But uh, one of the things they, or, or concerns or challenge they have is uh, when those Framingham symptoms are uh, present, so typically, uh, it is uh, 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 already in the late stage of the heart failure progression uh, uh, process. So this uh, means that the heart structure of the patient is already changed and it's not reversible. So it may not be the best uh, the best chance to like intervene or treat uh, the patient or to, to cure the disease. So if we can identify some early signals that can be indicative of uh, that this patient is going to have a high risk of having heart failure in the future, let's say that's what I mean by this X months, we set this X to like six, uh, 12 and 18. So which means that we predict, uh, I mean, how likely this patient is going to develop CHF, uh, of course, an onset risk uh, in the next, six, uh, 12 or 18 months. And by leveraging the information before uh, these, uh, 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 you know, X months, that's a, that's a period before this ex exclamation mark, uh, where we uh, kind of like extracted the information like uh, uh, demographics, like diagnosis, medication, but also symptoms extracted from clinical notes to see if we can find some predictors, early predictors of uh, uh, onset risk of congestive heart failure. So that's what we did. And we developed a model. I don't want to explain the mathematics, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I I don't have that performance shown uh, on this slide. But uh, what I want to show you is we use this model. We did observe a pretty good prediction performance using our method compared to those conventional like uh, logistic regression or those uh, standard uh, statistics model because we we did some uh, um, you know innovations and we we want to require like uh, uh, whatever model that is used into um, the final uh, uh, prediction so we want those uh, uh, predictors to be orthogonal or complementary to the set of existing you know, uh, symptoms and signs in Framingham symptom. So we want those, uh, those uh, uh, you know, factors to be really complementary, while at the same time, they are also representative. We, we don't encourage feature, uh, I mean, factor re redundancy in the prediction, but that's what the innovation is. And uh, finally, we, we kind of like picked out the top 10 uh, factors we we got a pretty good uh, pretty good performance so we want to investigate so what are the factors that picked out by our model that uh, you know uh, you know that that's that's a goal right so we want to identify some early pre uh, 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 predictors so these are the top ten predictors our model figured out and as you can see they are uh, uh, pretty diverse diverse in a sense some of them are di diagnosis some of them or medications in labs and also symptoms. And um, uh, we ask uh, two cardiologists uh, to help us to label uh, these uh, factors to see uh, their impression on whether you think these factors are really related to the future uh, risk of heart failure or no. And both of them uh, labeled like nine out of 10 are they think are could be really related to uh, heart failure, but there is one thing they're not sure that is a bone density regulator. So that's a that's a, that's a drug for treating bone density problem. So uh, 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 so one thing I want to uh, 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 remind is this paper was published in uh, 2012. Uh, so the study was done in 2011. So uh, I mean, the, both of them are not sure if there is a, a linkage or relationship between a bone density problem and heart failure. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, these are the papers. Uh, but um, later on, uh, if you check like this Jack uh, uh, paper, so this is published in 2014. So they study this bone density problem and heart failure. And there, this is the Jaha, these are clinical journals. So this this paper was published in 2017, study the same problem. And uh, this is another uh, paper published in 
uh, you know, um, 2018 also studied the, the same problem. So, so it's kind of like so we using the 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 uh, real world EHR data from Geisinger, we identified this potential relationship between, uh, you know, uh, bone density problem and heart failure. And at that time, the cardiologist or um, the domain expert was not sure about this. Uh, really, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, indicative of something or no, because we don't have the knowledge yet about that. But later on, as you can see, the, the clinical studies, uh, they are studying these, which means that clinically, people also observe uh, this kind of potential relationship, and they are doing clinical studies to investigate that. So this is kind of like one example showing the value of uh, mining insights from the data. So it's not just the validation of the existing clinical knowledge. It can potentially, because the data are objective, so whatever captured in the data is what, what happened uh, to the patients. And uh, we can also discover something that may not be known yet, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, according to domain knowledge. Uh, so that can potentially lead to novel discoveries. So that's kind of like one example showing um, so why these, uh, you know, data analysis could be uh, helpful and uh, important. Faye, I have a couple of questions if I can sure. um, ask sure. you quickly. Um, when you were doing the work with Geisinger, and that, this was 10 years ago, so yeah. this, is, this is groundbreaking work. But one of the challenges that we see in the analysis of health data is, you know, how do you measure data quality and the effect it has on uh, the effectiveness of your models? Is there a measurable difference that you see between structured and unstructured data? And, and how do you account for those as you develop a model? You know, these, the, the inherent, sometimes unavoidable um, unreliability or incompleteness of certain data in building a model. How do you account for that? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a very good uh, uh, question. So actually, especially for uh, EHR, so they are actually uh, within AMI, the Community of American Medical Informatics Association, there is a sub-community, -com they... Uh, 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 their focus is to study, uh, you know, quantitative measurement of the quality of EHR data, and they propose a set of uh, like indices that uh, like a missing rate or you know out of range these kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's uh, you can almost think of like a protocol. So you can, uh, you know, if more formally, you can use that as a, a kind of like uh, the guidance to assess the quality of your data before you do any analysis. And for our case, uh, this case with Geisinger, so they kind of like, because they, this is a cohort, they kind of like uh, uh, wants to, you know, uh, uh, study particularly for heart failure. So they already have done some quality control on their end. So that's why I said, I mean, it's a pretty high quality data compared to, mm -hmm the general EHR databases. Uh, but and another thing is uh, to your question, if we work with the general EHR population, so uh, one thing to like, like uh, you know, it's a, we, we should always account for this, like missingness, like, uh, you know, standardization, whatever. But, but uh, you know, different data have, uh, number one, have different ways. And um, number two is it is uh, always important to have a uh, validation or independent validation data set to you know make sure that your model is not overtuned or work by chance for one data but cannot generalize to other data. So that's a, a practice I have um, been following uh, in 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 the past ten years. Yeah. When when you develop a model, just continuing that, do you um, provide guidelines for how it should be used? to ensure uh, that the clinicians applying it understand how to interpret the results? I mean, are there biases that people need to be made aware of? Are there, are there conditions that need to obtain before someone goes off and uses one of these models to make clinical judgments? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a very, very good question. That's certainly what we have done in recent years, especially, you know, a lot of people propose a lot of reporting guidelines uh, for these AI models, especially if you want to use these models in clinical decision support. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, 
the the process of developing such a a, 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 a report or whatever a guideline or you even you can think of like a manual is to work closely with clinicians uh, because we I mean I I'm not a clinician I don't like uh, cannot answer the question you just ask like what's a condition we need to pay attention and when you use uh, what could be the risk these kind of things so work closely with them and understand their real need and this is really an interactive process rather than just we take the data and build a modern report to performance this is a, a interaction with clinicians is are, are really important we are aware of that and uh, we uh, I mean like uh, and and the uh, papers in recent years, we certainly uh, have uh, reported everything and made to not just the model, but also the code and, uh, if possible, the data available to the community. Yeah. Thank you. Just one last question, quickly. Um, how do you do, how do you evaluate your models for bias? I mean, when you when you think about the populations that you're looking at, we're in a world right now where healthcare is really trying to figure out how to be, you know more to increase the equity of healthcare to make sure that healthcare is that we we adjust healthcare so that everyone has an equal likelihood of having a good outcome and a lot of models have had bias we're reading recently about efforts to improve pulse oximetry for example because of skin yeah. tone uh, can you talk a little bit about what what you do in the way of sort of dealing with bias uh, accounting for bias, you know, understanding where it might appear more more than in other cases. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think this is also. I mean, I think recently, I, I think bias, first the bias and disparity, is not a new problem in medicine, and it is um, not a unique problem to AI. So it has been there for a long time. So it's a you know recently because AI or machine learning model needs data. Uh, to train. So people have been emphasized a lot on the potential biases, which is um, certainly understandable. So there are all, I mean, we have a, 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 a pretty recent uh, review uh, published on uh, Lancet eBiomedicine e talking about all kinds of biases. So those biases could come from the data, could come from uh, you know, um, the model, and it also could come from the people, the person who are going to use that. So first, you have to realize where this bias could come from. So for example, what, uh, for example, what kind of bias are you looking at? Is it like the bias, like a differential performance of the model with respect to different um, protected groups like white and black. So then just look at the distribution of your data across those different uh, protected groups. And uh, 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 if you do see, let's say, uh, white population is dominating, then you may need to think of adjust uh, uh, the model when you make the predictions on the black population. Um, and uh, also another thing is that since now we are aware, well aware of this bias issue and also um, uh, the, the, the demand of AI or machine learning is increasing. So uh, it, when you collect the data, um, so it, it, it is uh, important to be mindful about the population. Like uh, you don't, when you collect the data, you, you just, uh, you know, wants to collect the balanced data across different protected groups. And another important thing is interpretation. So, so uh, because a lot of these, um, uh, you know, uh, models are black boxes, complicated models. So people now, uh, a lot of studies are still focusing on, on interpreting why it works well. Uh, I mean, you know, achieve good performance. But actually, how it leads to bias is also an important research direction. We have some recent papers studying that. So it's, it's not interpret how the model is uh, behaving, uh, you know, uh, uh, good, uh, but why the model is, uh, uh, you know, behaving like in a biased way towards, let's say, certain population, what could be the uh, root cause that that uh, you know needs to be figured out and uh, because after that you can do some actions to make the model more you know uh, unbiased so i mean um it it, it needs to uh, be 
deal a case by case and also uh, uh, for different kinds of data it could also be different but uh, there are people are well aware of this and there are lots of uh, already a lot of tools uh, that we can leverage to do that and also a lot of guidelines um, when you do the report just to transparently report everything so people when people use your model like the exactly the the uh, example you you just said i mean the, the skin tone what what kind what what is skin tone when you train the model when you uh you know um use the data set these kind of things yeah great thank you very much okay uh, uh great so so that's uh that's a uh, uh, one example and uh, uh, uh this is another example we worked uh, with our uh, department of uh, uh, you know clinical lab medicine uh, so during the first uh, outbreak of COVID I think that was March April 2020 uh, so one of them you know uh, motivation of uh, doing this work we I mean first the, the the goal of this work is to for for remember uh, at that time uh, New York was uh, uh, the epicenter and uh, um, so, uh, you know, the hospitals are kind of like limited in the resource of uh, doing uh, PCR tests. So it is not everybody like today, everybody wants to get a test, you can get a test. So you have to demonstrate certain symptoms related to COVID in order to, uh, you know, um, uh, be qualified for the test. So uh, when, when you do the test, that means that when you do the test, the people already have some uh, symptoms demonstrated already. Um, and there are at that time, so there are some articles uh, uh, raising concerns about like uh, the, there could be high false negative rate for the PCR test, which means that the people who are uh, tested negative, they're not necessarily negative. So you let them go, they're gonna, you know, um, uh, spread the disease so uh, uh you know uh, our lab medicine colleagues um approached me uh, saying that since those patients who uh, get the test they already demonstrated some symptoms and they observe because uh, they already demonstrate symptoms so when they get the test that it's not just the, the the pcr test they typically also do some uh, routine blood test so they for those patients who actually got um uh, you know, COVID, they're going to demonstrate some abnormalities of their routine blood test. So they say, so can we build, because they are, because of their observation, they're saying, can we build a, a predictive model? So based on routine blood test profiles uh, to predict the actual SARS-CoV-2 infection status. So why do we want to do that? So number one is the, the, the concern about potential high false negative rate of PCR test. Number two is a PCR test. Uh, at that time, uh, it, it takes a uh, longer turnaround time. You have to wait for uh, typically two days to get the result. But the blood test is pretty fast. And also in terms of the resource. So those blood tests uh, are widely available everywhere, but for uh, the PCR test, it, I mean, the, the, the resource needs to do, to do that, the chemical uh, is limited. So so for these various reasons, uh, so they, they are hoping to get, if uh, there we can, a machine learning tool to do the prediction. So that's what we do. So we just collect, um, you know, the, the routine blood test results of every patient who took the PCR test the two days before the PCR test. And then we build some sort of uh, representations and train, a, train a, a, um, a predictor to predict uh, the patient is uh, actually having a SARS-CoV-2 infection later on or not. And actually the, the performance was, um, was pretty good. I mean, uh, if you can see from this, uh, uh, table like uh, uh, the best model can achieve the AUC, which is um, um, a measurement to measure quantitatively measure the performance. So one means perfect, zero means everything is wrong. So it can achieve an AUC of around 0.85, uh, so which is pretty good. And uh, the bottom figure actually shows there is a case because uh, we want to see if the model can help us capture the false negative. So this is a case of a patient in our database um, that uh, uh, he or she got a, a negative results, but uh, our model predicted the patient is having actually a 0.95 probability of uh, a positive 
uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And these we explained like these are the factors contributing to why we predict such a high uh, you know probability like older age, like uh, you know these high values of LDH, you know these inflammation markers, LDH ferritin. Uh, and 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 also this lymphocyte and so on. So all these indicate there must be some infection going on. So actually, if you look at the EHR database, this patient was uh, was negative, and within two days, um, uh, he or she came back to the hospital and got another test, uh, and the test turns to positive. So it is very likely the first uh, tested uh, uh, negative result is a false um, negative. So at that time, so our because of the you know volume. Um, and the capacity of the hospital. So especially in New York City, it was, uh, uh, you know, um, a, a pretty difficult time. So actually we were almost implementing this model in our emergency department. And uh, a, lot, a lot of media like this is uh, an example, Modern Healthcare reported uh, our algorithm. But, uh, you know, when time went to like uh, mid, late May and early June of 2020, everything changed. So uh, the testing policies uh, as a, uh, uh, like uh, what's changed to like uh, available to everybody and uh, you know the positive rate has been dr drastically decreasing so uh, later on you know uh, the demand is um, uh, uh, declining so uh, we finally did not really implement this um, uh, into our EHR system uh, but uh, this is kind of like a tool that at that time if uh, the situation continues could be very helpful and um, uh, you know, for uh, the clinical decisions on, uh, you know, how to deal and plan with the patients who presented to, let's say, ER and uh, did this um, uh, PCR test. So this is another example. And the third example is, as I uh, introduced at the uh, very beginning, so a lot of the diseases are heterogeneous. Um, so that's why we need uh, precision medicine or tailored treatment. So, uh, so this is, uh, 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 you know, very typical for COVID-19 because the patients with COVID-19, they demonstrate a whole bunch of uh, uh, clinical demonstrations. Um, so we are thinking of whether there are patterns uh, existing for those, uh, in this case, clinical patterns, because we still work on EHR uh, for these patients. And uh, can we identify those patterns as patient groups so that the patient within the same group, they have relatively homogeneous clinical uh, demonstration, which mean, which may indicate that these patients may have more, um, you know, homogeneous uh, causes or disease pathways. Uh, so you can, with with respect to different homogeneous groups, we call subphenotypes. Uh, you may uh, try to develop a customized treatment. So this is kind of like you can think of a transition between the conventional one size fits all. Uh, you know, medicine to the future precision medicine. This is kind of like a, a stratified medicine approach. But of course, the first step is to, uh, you know, identify or detect those uh, 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 stratas or uh, subphenotypes. So this is kind of like uh, we leverage uh, the, uh, the, the lab test the profile uh, of the patient at the time when they uh, got the PCR test. This is from March to June uh, 2020. Uh, we leveraged the EHR data uh, for uh, in the Insight Network, which is a clinical research network, including five major hospital systems in New York City. Uh, we want to see if we can identify some uh, patterns or subphenotypes of the patient who at the time of infection. So uh, we identified four subphenotypes and the, the top panel shows uh, if, uh, you know, characterization of those subphenotypes according to the abnormalities of their lab tests. Remember, we we uh, derive those subphenotypes according to their lab test profiles. Like subphenotype one, you see very, this blue one, you see very few belts. So if there is a belt, which means that uh, there are a certain percentage of patients in this subphenotype have, let's say in this case, inflammation abnormality uh, or renal ab abnormality. Um, uh, and the uh, width of this belt uh, is proportional to the pro uh, to the proportion of the patient 
in the subphenotype that have this corresponding abnormality. So you see subphenotype one is pretty mild, but subphenotype four is pretty severe. You see these very thick um, uh, belts linking to a lot of these different uh, you know, uh, biomarkers that are abnormal. And, and two and three, uh, this is one which is mild, this is four which is severe, and this is two and three which are moderate. But you can see for two, you see a pretty thick belt in linking to inflammation, but you don't see that, you don't really see that in, in three, although both of them are kind of like moderate, but two seems to be more, um, uh, suffer more from, uh, you know, inflammation. And uh, we then checked the other uh, uh, dimension, which is the comorbidity burden of these four subphenotypes, as you can see in this case, uh, mainly look at two and three. So three seems to suffer from more comorbidity burden compared to uh, two. So then we kind of like summarized the, the four subphenotypes as one mild, one severe. So one, which is in this case of phenotype two, suffer more from inflammation, but actually we checked their demographics, they are younger and um, uh, less uh, comorbidity burden, baseline comorbidity burden. So three, so they suffer less uh, inflammation, but, uh, but um, uh, they suffer more from the baseline comorbidity burden. And turns out this uh, group of patients, they are also older. Um, so this kind of like uh, uh, summarizes the, the clinical demonstrations according to the biomarkers or the lab tests of those patients at the time of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection confirmation. And uh, so you can think of like these uh, uh, different subphenotypes may indicate different ways of uh, treatment or management strategies. And uh, another recent work, which uh, was actually just uh, uh, appeared on Nature Medicine last week. So we also tried to figure out, so the previous work was to figure out the, the, the heterogeneity uh, of the patient, uh, COVID-19 patient at the time of infection. But now we are talking a lot about uh, the potential uh, post-acute infection uh, sequelae. So, and these, uh, uh, or PASC for short. So these conditions are highly diverse and you see reports from all different uh, places with different conditions covering different organ systems. So is there any patterns there or is it just a random, everybody can have uh, all kinds of uh, uh, potential PASC conditions. So we also uh, leverage uh, the, uh, the same clinical research network data. And in this case, we also get it validated in a similar clinical research network in Florida and make sure these subphenotypes are reproducible. And uh, these are the four subphenotypes we figured out. So the first one is dominated by cardiac and renal conditions. And a lot of the patients in this subphenotype, they got their, their infection confirmed during the first wave. We know the first wave are typically associated with the more severe clinical outcomes. And uh, there is subphenotype two, which is dominated by respiratory conditions accompanied with uh, sleep and anxiety problem. And we also see a lot of reports on the potential uh, neurological uh, sequelae of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. We also identified a subphenotype related to that. So musculoskeletal and nervous system conditions in subphenotype four is a, uh, also, uh, you know, aligns with uh, some recent paper talking about, you know, uh, the long-term existence uh, of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus detected in, uh, you know, COVID patients' fecal uh, samples, so they can exist there for like uh, more than seven months. So we also identify the subphenotype of patients that uh, complains a lot about digestive system problems and uh, com typically accompanied with uh, respiratory conditions. So these are uh, these kind of like um, summarizes uh, what could be the patterns, or you know, when when patient have these, what are the different types of patients when they suffer from those potential. Uh, you know, post-acute infection sequelae, uh, you know, um, uh, conditions for, for COVID-19 and potentially can be suggestive of future mechanistic studies on how the SARS-CoV-2 infection can impact those uh, different organ systems. And uh, if they kind of like going to be linked to each other, like some of these are involving like this case, uh, not one, just one organ system and the potential treatment 
development for uh, you know uh, uh, these uh, uh, past conditions. Uh, I think that's pretty much all I want to talk about. And uh, yeah, this is the last question. I mean, not related to clinical data, but we have also done some example. In this case, we developed a chatbot to hopefully screen if a patient is having a cognitive uh, problem or no, but uh, actually not just that. So my lab actually have been touching all kinds. I, you can think of like a full, full spectrum of uh, biomedical data from uh, omics, uh, to you know, uh, uh, you know, batch uh, omics and uh, you know, um, uh, single cell omics into histo histology or pathology. So we have been doing some cancer slash Alzheimer's disease slash uh, slash um, uh, you know rheumatology like uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, I mean, on these molecular data and EHR data, of course, medical image. Uh, physiological signals like we have studies on EKGs and EEGs, uh, clinical assessment, the Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, those conditions, you need lots of clinical assessment on the motor, uh, you know, capabilities and also cognition uh, and patient generated data, variable devices uh, for mental health and uh, uh, some other behavioral health related problems and also drug design. Uh, and also uh, biomedical literature is where we extracted the existing knowledge across, uh, you know, all disease domains and different data types from the biomedical literature. So uh, we, we uh, my lab has also uh, uh, built one of that so you can search uh, knowledge from the uh, knowledge graph. And these are kind of like the diseases we have been touching and also the collaborations across uh, different institutions nationally. Uh, I think with all that, I would like to thank you. And uh, this is my email and web page and also uh, Twitter. Wow, thank you. Hey, that's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating work and the comprehensiveness of, of the work your lab is doing across all of these domains, across all of these sources of data, across all of these po populations of patients is really exceptional and um, extremely impressive. We have a, a number of additional questions I'd like to run by you. Sure. Um, uh, the first question is, um, have you done any analysis on the effect of specific conditions that are likely to result in more severe infections in terms of the severity of the disease, particularly how they react when a patient has more than one such condition? You know, that we talk about people with chronic disease, uh, is the severity of their chronic disease or the multiplicity of their chronic diseases? Uh, have you done work in understanding how those uh, affect the severity of their COVID infection should they become infected? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, that's more um, a more challenging task. So the COVID work I have shown, especially for the Pascal work, we really just look at new uh, conditions after you got the COVID infection, but actually uh, another ongoing efforts we are doing is worsening. So let's say if you have diabetes before, let's say you are uh, not relying on insulin, but after COVID you got, you, you have to rely on insulin. So this kind of worsening, of course, it is more difficult to define. Uh, so how do you judge a worsening or no, according to EHR? Um, and also it has a higher, you know, requirement on the quality of data. So you have to have reasonable coverage of the information you need uh, for the worsening judgment. But we are currently working on that. I think we are doing like, uh, uh, of course, diabetes, cardiovascular, pulmonary, um, and the brain fog that's neurological and also uh, pregnancy. So, you know, we all know like uh, anemia is kind of like uh, by default, a, a, a prevalent, you know, uh, comorbidity for pregnant women, but uh, their study found that if you got COVID, your anemia gonna be uh, raised to a different severity level. Uh, so these kind of things. So we, we have different work streams on trying to define that and also see what are, like you asked, as to what could be the risk factors, like the multiplicity. If you have diabetes, you also have re chronic kidney disease, then well, that likely to lead to more risk that your diabetes is going to uh, be worsened or something like that. But that's important and excellent question where uh, that's underway. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Uh, how do you measure the appropriateness of the responses of the chatbot? What is consider considered acceptable to avoid frustration in users? <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. So for, so for yeah, yeah, no, I know. I mean, uh, for this, I think for this work, I didn't uh, introduce this in very detail. So the ultimate goal of this is um, to, through uh, your chat with the agent. Uh, so hopefully it can uh, reach a conclusion that this person uh, is having a cognitive problem or no uh, with the least number of wrongs. So uh, in other words, so uh, the, the, like, like uh, we plotted all those, uh, you know, performance curves. So how do we measure? It's really the actual label. Label, I mean, uh, if the patient is actually having a cognitive problem or no, compared to the conclusion uh, draw uh, by the um, uh, agent. So um, we are not really comparing like within each round if uh, this person is talking about something completely not understandable or no. So we didn't really look at that. So we just let the agent, uh, you know, do dialogue with the patient and then come up with a, a conclusion if uh, the final conclusion, if this patient is having a problem or not. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, final question. What types of things do you think we'll be using AI to do in healthcare three to five years from now? Three to you know, five sort of, years. Yeah, three yeah, to yeah. five years. What do you see? What do you, where do you see this going? I, I think, and I firmly believe, uh, it's not just, the, uh, you're going to see it more and more in three to five years, but also to the future. So it's a really, uh, you know, integration of the, you know, really the constellation of all those different kinds of data. It's, it's not going to be just the biological data or molecular data or clinical data, because as I said, so all those different data pieces going to reflect a certain aspect of the disease. And the, you, you can see the reason why uh, recent years, like UK Biobank, like all of us. So why, you know, people studying, uh, starting all these initiatives because people realize you cannot just, you know, uh, uh, you know study a disease based on single uh, or limited uh, aspects. You really need to have a comprehensive understanding by capturing all kinds of information. Uh, of the patient about the condition. So I, I'm, I'm sure, so of course these initiatives takes time. So which means that uh, like, I don't know in how many years you're gonna have a large number of patients where you have every information, everything captured for him or her. But at the same time, we still have those uh, scattered data sets like uh, for Alzheimer's, we have a population, we have imaging genetics, we have another population, we have their EHRs, we have the third population who are in clinical trials. These are different populations. You have different data captured for them. So is there any chance that we can do analysis by integrating those scattered data sources? You know, they're captured with respect to different populations, but with the same disease, but also different aspects. I don't think anything is readily available now for exploring this kind of um, data, but but I firmly uh, believe like this, uh, you know, comprehensive analysis of data from different aspects, different populations, you're going to see them more and more. Of course, they're uh, more uh, related uh, challenges you're going to see, like the privacy, like the bias. This, by the way, this can also help with bias because you're integrating more data. Uh, and like the quality, like different data have different quality controls, right? So there are lots of related challenges, but I, I firmly believe if this is going to be where AI is going to be super helpful and uh, we, we could potentially see some breakthroughs. Yeah. Well, we're right approaching the top of the hour. And I want to thank you, uh, Professor Wang, for joining us today and for sharing with us an absolutely fascinating overview of your research. Um, the sheer comprehensiveness of what you're doing, obviously the passion that you bring to it, um, the passion that your lab and the, the folks with whom you work bring to it is evident in what we're seeing and what we saw today. Uh, we are very uh, grateful and appreciative of your spending your time with us today. Uh, we have many folks in the audience, I'm sure, who have come away from this knowing much more than they imagined they would know when they started just an hour ago, which is a wonderful outcome. Um, 
So uh, again, I want to thank you for, for joining us. I also want to thank those, uh, those of you, our audience who have joined us today um, and uh, hope that you can join us in the upcoming webinars and events that we have hosted over the coming weeks. Um, so with that, uh, I will say a final thank you and uh, good luck and Godspeed, uh, a fay to you and your work. And um, ladies and gentlemen, please take a moment to complete the survey uh, that will pop up on your screen as soon as we end our webinar today. And with that, I'll adjourn. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.